Over the past 30 years, the death rate from heart attacks in many countries was cut in half. What is the reason for this dramatic development? The world's number one killer disease, heart attacks, has been tamed. In some countries, like Germany, the number of deaths from heart attacks has been cut in half over the past three decades. In the Netherlands, it was even reduced by two-thirds. The world over, heart attacks and strokes have declined at an unprecedented speed, making the control over this disease one of the greatest advances in global health in this generation, with tens of millions of lives already rescued. The only parallel in the history of medicine would be the discovery of microorganisms as the cause of infectious disease by Louis Pasteur and others one and a half centuries ago. But even that discovery would take many decades before the first public health consequences could be seen. And even today, humankind is still haunted by infectious pandemics like COVID. Thus, it is incredibly important that we all understand the precise reasons for this dramatic global reduction in heart attacks and other forms of cardiovascular disease. With so many other health concerns in the world, why do you think the prevention of cardiovascular disease should be given a priority in global healthcare? Cardiovascular disease, namely heart attacks and strokes, are still the number one cause of death in the world. In many countries, every third man and woman are dying prematurely from this disease. Almost 18 million people each year worldwide. This number is comparable to the depopulation of some of the largest metropoles in the world each year. Cities of the size of Mumbai, Moscow, Cairo, Los Angeles, Bangkok, Buenos Aires, Tehran, Lagos, Paris, London and others. It is an intriguing fact that while almost 18 million people worldwide are dying each year of cardiovascular disease, this disease is essentially unknown in the entire animal world. Atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries that causes heart attacks and strokes, can be experimentally induced in animals, but an epidemic of cardiovascular disease does not occur in other species and remains a hallmark of the human race. Our research over the past decades has focused on shedding light on this phenomenon and provide insight in order to significantly reduce the death rates from heart attacks and strokes with the goal to save millions of lives. Already 30 years ago, I published several scientific publications together with Dr. Linus Pauling that laid the groundwork for an entirely new understanding of cardiovascular disease. Tell us about Dr. Pauling. How did you come to work with him? Dr. Pauling was one of the most distinguished scientists of the 20th century. His discoveries included principles of immunology, the basic structure of proteins, as well as the first identified genetic disease, sickle cell anemia. He received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1954 and in 1962 he received the Nobel Prize for Peace for his humanitarian commitment to help bring about the first nuclear test ban treaty. In his later years he became interested in the role of vitamins and other micronutrients in the fight against cancer, the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV and other diseases. In 1989, Dr. Pauling invited me, based on my earlier work, to join him at his institute in California to start a research direction in the role of micronutrients in the prevention of cardiovascular diseases. Shortly before his death in 1994, Dr. Pauling asked me to continue his life work in the field of vitamin research. What was the significance of the discoveries you published with Linus Pauling? We were able to show for the first time that the phenomenon that animals do not suffer from an epidemic of cardiovascular disease is closely related to their ability to produce rather high amounts of vitamin C inside their bodies. 
In contrast, this ability was lost by a genetic mutation in the ancestor of men and all human beings today are entirely dependent on getting an optimum amount of this vitamin in their daily diet. As shown in this graph, vitamin C is required for the production of collagen and other reinforcement molecules that provide basic stability to our entire body, including the walls of our arteries. The left column answers the question why animals do not get heart attacks and strokes. The internal production of vitamin C in optimum amounts protects the stability of their blood vessel walls, so no blood vessel hardening or clogging occurs. In contrast, the column at the right on this picture shows what happens in the human body under extreme conditions such as scurvy. Centuries ago, seafaring nations tried to circumnavigate the globe in ship voyages lasting a year or more. After a few months, the deadly consequences of complete vitamin C depletion in the human body could be observed in the sailors aboard. They began to die. Unable to produce vitamin C in their bodies and the fresh vegetables aboard rotten after only a few weeks. The production of reinforcing collagen in their bodies ceased. Their blood vessels became leaky and most of the sailors died from unstoppable blood loss. Finally, the column in the middle shows what happens in the bodies of hundreds of millions of people in the world today. Most of them get some vitamins in their diet. So open scurvy is rare today. But this is not enough and almost all people get too little micronutrients in their diet from fruits and vegetables and consequently suffer from what is called chronic vitamin deficiency. Thus, over years and decades of too little micronutrient intake, our blood vessels become weak and develop millions of tiny cracks and lesions. Our body then reacts to these microscopic wounds along the inside of our blood vessel pipeline and tries to repair them. Just like it tries to repair a wound in the skin inflicted by a knife cut. If this repair process in the inside of the blood vessel wall continues over years and decades, it eventually overshoots and the dangerous deposits develop inside the blood vessel walls that we call atherosclerotic deposits. These deposits or plaques eventually clog our arteries and cause heart attacks, strokes and other forms of cardiovascular disease. How have these discoveries been influencing our understanding of cardiovascular disease? This new understanding about the nature of cardiovascular disease provided important answers to very basic questions that could not previously be answered by doctors and cardiologists anywhere in the world. The first question that was left unanswered was why do people suffer from infarctions of the heart, that is heart attacks, but not of the nose, the ears or the knees or other parts of the body? The answer to this question is, the heart is the only organ of the human body that is constantly active, day and night. As the pump of our blood circulation, the heart muscle contracts with every heartbeat about 100,000 times each day. And with every heartbeat, the coronary arteries on the surface of the heart are literally squeezed flat. The blood vessel pipeline in a human body is very long with all the arteries, veins and small capillaries. It measures about 60,000 miles or about 100,000 kilometers. So we have to explain why this extremely long pipeline clocks primarily in the short segments of the coronary arteries, about the 300 millionth part of the entire blood vessel pipeline. The answer why millions of people suffer heart attacks from the clogging of the short coronary arteries can be logically explained. The mechanical stress 
on the walls of the coronary arteries from the continuous pumping of the heart exposes the underlying structural weakness of the blood vessel walls caused by vitamin deficiencies. Thereby, it is right here in the coronary arteries of the heart that the repair process begins, ultimately leading to the development of dangerous atherosclerotic plaques. The next question that had remained unanswered thus far was, why do people develop atherosclerotic deposits in the arteries, but not in the veins? Again, our research provided the answer. The relatively high blood pressure in the arterial part of our blood vessel system exposes the underlying structural weakness of the blood vessel wall first in the arterial system. In the venous system, by contrast, the blood pressure is extremely low, explaining why venosclerosis, the hardening of veins, is essentially unknown. The same understanding, of course, now also provides an explanation for the increased risk of heart attacks and in particular strokes associated with high blood pressure or hypertension. The increased blood pressure overstretches the blood vessel walls, thereby further exposing the underlying structural weakness. And finally, we answered the most intriguing question of all. Why do people get heart attacks, but animals don't? As mentioned before, most animals produce vitamin C in their bodies in amounts to provide optimum stability and elasticity to their blood vessel walls. Humans, unable to produce vitamin C in their bodies and frequently getting insufficient micronutrients in their diet, generally suffer from weakened blood vessel walls and are prone to the development of cardiovascular diseases. This new concept also provided entirely new definitions for the atherosclerotic deposits, as well as for cardiovascular disease itself. Atherosclerotic deposits are an overshooting repair mechanism of the human body trying to repair the weakened blood vessel walls. This, of course, implies that these deposits are no longer needed once the structural integrity of the blood vessel wall is fully restored by an optimum supply of micronutrients. This logic explanation demands also a new definition of cardiovascular disease in general. Cardiovascular disease can no longer be seen as a fatalistic process randomly affecting millions of people. It is rather a regulatory repair process that has overshot and led to the formation of deposits. Most significantly then, this disease is in principle reversible, at least in its early stages. In a clinical study, we have proven that these discoveries are not just theory. In patients with beginning coronary atherosclerosis, we measured their coronary calcification by means of computed tomography before and during a one-year follow-up with optimum micronutrient supplementation. This measure was able to hold the progression of calcium deposits in the coronary arteries. In some cases, the coronary deposits were even reversed or disappeared completely, as seen in this patient. This was the first clinical documentation of natural reversal of human coronary artery disease. The publication of this study can be found on the website of our foundation. The original scientific publications I wrote together with Linus Pauling had the titles Solution to the Puzzle of Human Cardiovascular Disease and in a second one a Unified Theory of Human Cardiovascular Disease. Both these landmark scientific articles can be accessed too via the website of our foundation. For a detailed description of this medical advance for the general public, I refer to my book entitled Why Animals Don't Get Heart Attacks But People Do, which is available in more than 20 languages online and for free. So no one can say I didn't know. What you are saying is that high cholesterol levels are not the main cause for heart attacks and strokes 
but rather vitamin deficiency is. The cholesterol theory postulates that elevated levels of cholesterol circulating in the bloodstream of a person damage the walls of the blood vessels and thereby induce the process of atherosclerosis. But there is something fundamentally wrong with this model. Cholesterol levels are the same level throughout the entire bloodstream. The arteries, veins and the small capillaries that are many kilometers long in a person. If cholesterol would damage the blood vessel walls, this would happen first in the tiny capillaries and would inevitably lead to infarctions in our fingers, toes and other remote parts of our body, causing what is called peripheral vascular disease. This is obviously not the case. Elevated levels of cholesterol can never explain the very localized occurrence of infarctions in the rather short coronary arteries and the primary manifestation of cardiovascular disease in form of heart attacks. Any plumber is familiar with this phenomenon if the water quality in the pipeline of a city is poor, for example by too high calcium concentrations. The water pipeline clocks along its entire length. In the same way, if cholesterol would damage the walls of the blood vessel pipeline, it would clock along its entire length of many kilometers, not just in the relatively short portion of arteries supplying blood to the heart or the brain. This fact logically excludes cholesterol as a primary cause of cardiovascular disease. But there is an even more convincing argument to discard high cholesterol levels in the bloodstream as a primary risk factors. Bears and other hibernators, animals that sleep during the winter months, they enter hibernation with blood cholesterol levels of 600 to 800 milligrams per deciliter or 15 to 20 millimole per liter. If cholesterol would be toxic to the blood vessel walls, these animals would have become extinct long ago from an epidemic of heart attacks and strokes. So the reason why they are still around despite seasonally very high cholesterol levels can now also be explained. These animals produce optimum amounts of vitamin C in their bodies and get additional micronutrients in their diet. So their blood vessel walls are optimally protected during the hibernation months and even elevated, highly elevated cholesterol levels cannot affect them. To be clear, trying to keep cholesterol and other fats at a reasonable level is a good health advice. However, any recommendation to artificially lower cholesterol levels below 240 or even 200 milligrams per deciliter needs to be revised in light of this new understanding. Such recommendations would arbitrarily define hundreds of millions of people in the world as patients without any scientific and logical basis. The primary beneficiaries of such unwarranted recommendations, of course, would be the multi-billion pharmaceutical investment business with cholesterol-lowering drugs. How did the international community of cardiologists react to your discoveries? One of the first letters of recognition for this medical advance came from the head of the cardiac unit of Harvard University at that time, Dr. Valentin Fuster. On July 6, 1992, he wrote to me, I just read your article written with Dr. Pauling on the role of ascorbic acid deficiency in vascular diseases. It is an excellent article which points out the many roles of vitamin C in the regulation of vascular processes. You may be interested to know that our own group, that is Harvard Medical School, is getting involved in this line of research. You may be quite correct in your predictions of the importance of ascorbate. And the letter ends with, thank you very much again for your confidence in writing to me. I wish you the best, and signed by Dr. Fuster. Unfortunately, the majority of cardiologists I met in the following years were less enthusiastic. Of course, there was a reason for this reluctance.
Many of these doctors and researchers were financially or dogmatically dependent on the cholesterol dogma and have remained reluctant to accept the compelling logic and growing scientific evidence. It is only during the last decade that more and more scientists and medical doctors from around the world are publicly advocating the health benefits of vitamins and micronutrients in the fight against cardiovascular disease and other health problems. You also issued a call, together with Dr. Pauling, for an international effort towards the control of cardiovascular disease. In early April 1992, Dr. Pauling gave a lecture at the King Edward Hotel in Toronto to a large audience of scientists, health advocates and politicians, including the representative of the Queen of England. Significantly, the government of Canada should come to play an important role in drawing world attention to the problem of micronutrient deficiency within a few years. We had worked out a call for an international effort to abolish heart disease, to eliminate it, which was presented at the Toronto conference. This historic document is preserved in Dr. Pauling's own handwriting and ends with the following words. The goal of eliminating heart disease as the major cause of death and disability is now in sight. It was signed in both our names. Based on this new understanding about the nature of cardiovascular disease we had just published, this call was an international appeal to the scientific community, to political decision takers and to the people of the world to embark on a vigorous effort to make the breathtaking perspective we had outlined a reality, that is, ending the cardiovascular epidemic. In order to bring the message about the scientific perspective of eventually eliminating cardiovascular disease to the attention of the world, we even organized a press conference at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco on July 2, 1992. A video clip from this historic press meeting has survived and is accessible on the website of our foundation. This call for an international effort to abolish heart disease should become the last public appeal of the two-time Nobel laureate who passed away merely two years later. You can download the complete text of this historic call also from the website of our foundation. What happened with this effort? At the same time, in April 1992, Time magazine, one of the journals with the greatest impact on public opinion in the US published the title story The Real Power of Vitamins. New research shows they may help fight cancer, heart disease and the ravages of aging. This lead story of Time magazine signified a turnaround in the anti-vitamin position upheld for almost a century by mainstream media influenced of course by pharmaceutical interests. But the US media were not the only ones reacting to this scientific breakthrough. Here are some of the reactions by international organizations starting the very same year, 1992. In spring of this year, the government of Canada, together with few other organizations, launched an international project called Micronutrient Initiative. It was later joined by UNICEF and other international organizations and became known as Vitamin Mineral Deficiency Initiative. In December 1992, the same year, the World Health Organization and the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization held an international conference in Rome and issued a comprehensive World Declaration and Plan of Action for Nutrition. In 2009, the WHO published a united call to action on vitamin and mineral deficiencies. In 2015, the US National Institutes of Health published a document entitled The Epidemiology of Global Micronutrient Deficiencies, recommending that 
Multidimensional, coordinated and sustainable strategies are needed to combat micronutrient deficiencies. You can get full access to these documents via the website of our foundation. So, over the past three decades, similar national programs to combat micronutrient deficiency were also announced in many countries. It is surely noteworthy that none of such international programs to combat the global epidemic of vitamin deficiencies had been launched prior to the publication of our scientific discoveries on the role of micronutrients on the prevention of cardiovascular disease. In the early 1990s, the desire of tens of millions of people in the US to take full advantage of this new health information on the natural prevention of cardiovascular disease and other common diseases reached the level of the US government. Little more than two years after the publication of these breakthrough discoveries, US Congress unanimously passed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, DSHEA, of August 1994. This federal act lifted a century-old legal ban that was largely blocking the dissemination of the health benefits of vitamins and other natural therapies. This ban, of course, had been imposed by the political stakeholders of the pharmaceutical investment business to protect its monopoly on human health with patented drugs. This US legislation, also known as Vitamin Freedom Act, allowed for the first time scientifically proven health information in relation to vitamins and other natural therapies to be freely published. The decades-long censorship on the health benefits of vitamins and other natural therapies had been broken. Significantly, this new legislation triggered an explosion of micronutrient research at universities and research centers around the world over the following decades. In 2004, UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Emergency Fund, joined by other international organizations, took their global vitamin and mineral deficiency initiative to a new level. They drew attention to the fact that one third of the world's population, at that time more than two billion people, suffered from chronic micronutrient and mineral deficiencies. These deficiencies, the Vitamin Mineral Deficiency Initiative Policy Paper Notes, sentenced hundreds of millions of children, especially in the developing countries, to grow up with preventable physical and mental deficiencies, many of which would cripple them for life. This call was heard across the globe. On September 3, 2004, the Chinese government issued an official response to this initiative entitled Vitamins and Minerals for Children Fortifies Economic Development in China, predicting that the protection of 250 million people in China from hidden hunger, vitamin deficiency that is, could boost the Chinese gross domestic product by 86 billion dollars over 10 years. The joint press statement by the Chinese Ministry of Health and UNICEF further read, China's massive drive to reduce the damage done by vitamin and mineral deficiency, particularly to children, is paying rich dividends for its economy. Food fortification is an internationally recognized means of bringing vitamins and minerals to the majority of a country's population. In poor communities, providing supplements via low-cost vitamin and mineral capsules, syrups or tablets can be a critical tool to bring down child mortality and improve quality of life for millions. So far the policy paper. In retrospect, these public health strategies announced in 2004 sound like a prophecy about China's economic development over the forthcoming decades. The global call to fight the so-called hidden hunger, that is vitamin and mineral deficiency, was also heard in the developing world. A policy paper developed specifically for the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa was entitled 
a partnership drive to end hidden hunger in Sub-Saharan Africa. The title page emphasized vitamin and mineral deficiency affect a third of Sub-Saharan Africa's people, affecting minds, bodies, energies and the economic prospects of nations. Unfortunately, in many countries of Sub-Saharan Africa and other developing regions of the world, these well-founded health initiatives were soon abandoned due to the lack of funding and other constraints. In many cases, the logical approach to provide basic health to millions of people through effective, safe and affordable vitamins and micronutrients were sacrificed under the growing influence of the multi-billion dollar interests of the pharmaceutical export business of patented drugs. Did this explosion of knowledge about the beneficial role of vitamins actually help to reduce heart attacks and strokes in the world? To answer this question, I would like to share with you three graphs that express the developments over the past decades better than many words. Graph A documents the explosion of scientific research publications about the health benefits of vitamins in cardiovascular diseases since the publication of our new understanding of cardiovascular disease in the early 1990s. Graph B shows the more than 20-fold increase in global vitamin C production over the past three decades, a precondition to meet the increased need to cope with widespread vitamin deficiencies. The third graph, named C, documents the global decline of heart attacks and strokes exactly in parallel to the increasing scientific information and increased global production of essential vitamins. While these statistical data are already impressive, only a closer look at the actual research and clinical studies on the health benefits of micronutrients can adequately reflect the significance of this development for the health and lives of hundreds of millions of people. We documented some of the most important research and clinical publications in the prevention of heart attacks, strokes, high blood pressure, arrhythmia, heart failure, diabetes and other diseases in an online library on the website of our foundation. We did this in order to assist people and patients around the world to inform themselves about the options of science-based natural health they have. Of course, there were other factors involved too in reducing the frequency of cardiovascular disease the implementation of public health programs, nutritional consultation of people at risk and other measures have been important contributors to the reduction of deaths from cardiovascular disease. The role of cholesterol-lowering drugs, however, has become increasingly controversial for several reasons. Firstly, as mentioned before, high cholesterol levels can no longer be considered as the primary cause of cardiovascular disease. Secondly, the cholesterol heart disease hypothesis has been feeding the pharmaceutical investment business with global revenues for cholesterol-lowering statin drugs alone of several hundred billion dollars paid by people and governments around the world. Thirdly, and most importantly, during the past decade, the devastating side effects of long-term use of statins became public knowledge. These statin drugs, while promising to reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease, have been shown in recent clinical studies to actually accelerate the calcification of the coronary arteries of the heart by up to four times compared to patients who did not take statins. Large doctors' associations, for example, those working with dialysis patients, are publicly debating to ban statins from their practices. Significantly, even these serious side effects of statin drugs, the accelerated calcification of blood vessel walls, can be inhibited by vitamin C. 
The research team of our institute under its director, Dr. Alexandra Nitzwicki, documented that this vitamin is able to prevent the dangerous side effects of statin drugs and reduce the overproduction of calcium by the cells of the artery walls. Why do you think there is some reluctance in accepting this logical understanding by the medical community? In Western Europe, in the US, as well as in certain other pharmaceutical export countries, the influence of this investment business on medical education and the medical profession in general has been devastating. The closeness to the pharmaceutical investment business is an official criterion for the appointment of department heads in medical schools. The education of young doctors at medical schools of these countries is synchronized with the multi-billion dollar export interests of patented pharmaceutical drugs. Consequently, generations of young doctors leave their medical schools as a sales force for patented pharmaceutical drugs, trained in the interests of a global investment business. Fortunately, there is now an increasing number of young doctors who grow up with the new scientific facts and are open to embrace science-based natural health approaches as part of a comprehensive new health approach. But considering the fact that millions of people today are still dying from heart attacks and strokes, there exists an obvious necessity to remove all unnecessary obstacles and embrace new life-saving health concepts. This is why we addressed our international call to end heart disease, not only to scientists, but also to political decision takers and above all to the public at large. After all, this new understanding of the nature of cardiovascular disease is so logical and clear that it can be understood by anyone, anywhere in the world. What you are really advocating is a public health program focusing on prevention. What does the World Health Organization say about such a preventive public health program? In 1978, the World Health Organization held an international conference on primary health care and issued the Declaration of Alma-Ata. This declaration emphasizes the fact that comprehensive health on a global scale can only be obtained by a focus on the prevention of diseases and by the involvement of the general population as architects of preventive health care. Unfortunately, this important global public health program has remained largely a declaration. And in the meantime, the once independent World Health Organization has been turned into a private-public partnership with the pharmaceutical investment industry having an undue influence on current global health policies. What role does public health education play on the way to preventive health care? Public health education about the comprehensive health benefits of vitamins and other plant-derived micronutrients is the basis for an effective preventive health care anywhere. Strategic healthcare policies towards prevention should include basic information about the health benefits of fruits, vegetables and its micronutrient ingredients to be provided at all levels of education from kindergarten throughout the entire school system to general public health education programs. Fruit and vegetable gardens should be initiated at schools, health institutions, senior homes and throughout the communities in order to provide theoretical knowledge and practical experience about the benefits of nutritional health and the power of agricultural based medicine. We have launched such a primary health program in one of the poorest countries in the world, Uganda. Ten-year-old school children are being taught in the classroom about the benefits of certain fruits to protect their heart and their body. The students then apply this knowledge by planting these fruits and vegetables in an adjacent school garden. 
A student health parliament takes the decisions on organizing and maintaining this garden. And finally, the students take their experiences from the school back to the communities where they come from to launch a multitude of community gardening projects. This Movement of Life project has positively influenced the health and lives of over 100,000 people in a relatively short time. If a self-sustaining project like this works in some of the poorest countries of the world, it will work anywhere. Recently, you raised your voice about the pharmaceutical investment business and its threat to world peace. What is the background of your warning? During recent decades, medical research into the comprehensive health benefits of vitamins and other micronutrients has become one of the fastest growing fields of medicine in general. It is visible today that before long the knowledge about the effective and safe health benefits of such non-patentable micronutrients will replace entire groups of patented pharmaceutical drugs that are merely covering symptoms but do not treat the underlying disease. Everyone should understand the multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical export business operating primarily out of Germany, some other European countries and the US is not a health industry but an investment business. This entire business model has been built over the past century on the patenting of synthetic drugs. Because the patent royalties represent the return on investment for this industry. Now the advances in the field of non-patentable science-based natural health are threatening to replace entire categories of such patented drugs, each of which catering to a global market worth billions of dollars. Here, for example, you see the explosion of scientific publications for two areas of utmost relevance for global health. On the left, you see the increase of scientific publications in connection with the health benefits of vitamins in cardiovascular disease. On the right, you see the increase in scientific publications on the health benefits in the fight against infectious diseases. The pending demise of the pharmaceutical investment business, largely triggered by the breathtaking advances in the field of science-based natural health, are also the greatest threat to world peace today. The military provocations currently occurring around the world are being primarily led by a handful of countries representing more than 80% of the global pharmaceutical export business. Obviously, their contingency plan is the following. Continue the unscrupulous investment business with patented drugs under global martial law. Martial law means war. The unscrupulous game plan of these special interests to provoke regional or global conflicts must be exposed. This is why I publicly warned about the pending dangers of a major war. Exposing the financial interests behind these war plans is the only way to make them impossible. Because then the entire world would point their fingers at the perpetrators. Are you saying that the build-up of preventive healthcare is a contribution to world peace? The people and the political decision takers of the world need to understand the global transition in healthcare from managing diseases with patented drugs to their prevention and possible elimination based on effective non-patentable health approaches. The latter is incompatible with the continuation of the investment business with patented pharmaceutical drugs. Every political leader in the world has to take a decision now. Do they want to continue serving a small group of financial stakeholders in the pharmaceutical investment business based on the expansion of diseases? 
Or do they want to serve the health interests of their people in further reducing the death rates from cardiovascular disease and other health problems? Considering the fact that the vested financial and political interests behind the multi-trillion dollar pharmaceutical investment business will not give up their privileges voluntarily, the world is entering its most perilous phase in the nuclear age. For responsible political leaders to fully embrace the breathtaking advances of natural health research in the fight against cardiovascular disease, cancer and other health problems is an essential political tool to secure world peace in addition to any military preparedness. Three decades ago, I was privileged to help contribute a scientific discovery that created the basis for this major health advance for all mankind. By calling on scientists, doctors, politicians and billions of people, Dr. Pauling and I defined a goal that promises to unite all mankind in the forthcoming years. The goal of eliminating heart disease as the major cause of death and disability is now in sight. With millions of lives each year at stake, no time should be lost. 